creating a family tree, in a sense, of all of these mitochondrial DNA lineages. And what um, uh, Alan Wilson and his, his students, Becky Kahn and Mark Stone King, found was that the most kind of the, the most ancient lineages in this family tree could be traced back to lineages in Africa. And this uh, therefore identified Africa as the homeland, not only of the fossil hominids that we knew from the archeological record, but the origin of all modern humans. And this challenge, or this was in a sense, the kind of final um, piece in a, in a debate that had been going on for quite some time, uh, mostly amongst the archeologists about whether or not modern humans evolved in Africa and replaced uh, population, hominid populations elsewhere, or whether Homo erectus, we know, came out of, of Africa and was present uh, elsewhere in the world, including down here in island Southeast Asia, uh, evolved into Homo sapiens uh, in, in their own region, in this, this, this debate called regional side of the debate called regional continuity. So the mitochondrial DNA evidence suggested that indeed modern human origins were in Africa. Now this is a bit of biology 101 for those of you who aren't familiar with this. What is mitochondrial DNA and how does it work? Well, most people know about DNA and the DNA that makes you unique and, and an individual who you are. Most of the DNA that people think about in terms of their characteristics and so forth is what we call nuclear DNA, DNA. DNA that's found in the nucleus of the cell. And that DNA you inherit from both of your parents, on average 50% from your mother and 50% from your father. And that mixes up in very unique ways to make you the unique individual that you are. But there's also in the cell these little guys out here called mitochondria. And mitochondria also have their own DNA. And that is mitochondrial DNA. And the interesting thing about mitochondrial DNA is that it is only uh, maternally inherited. So this is generally when we talk about DNA, and I'll be talking about DNA sequences and comparing DNA. How do we actually compare DNA? We look at the DNA, the sequence of the, the bases, the four letters uh, in the DNA alphabet that make up DNA, and we compare those bases. And so when I talk about BP, when I'm talking about DNA, that's base pairs of DNA and how many base pairs we're actually looking at. Looking at the DNA sequence is actually just reading the letters um, of the DNA, the sequence of those letters. So we can actually get DNA sequence from a number of individuals and align it. Okay, so that we're comparing the same part of the DNA, and we can start to see how closely related or how similar those DNA sequences are. And that tells us something about how recently they shared a common ancestor. So on the, the basis that DNA sequences that are more similar probably shared a, a, an ancestor more recently than sequences that are more different, that are further apart or, or have, have more differences in their DNA sequence. So sample one is, is a lot uh, different from sample four. Sample four is more closely related to sample three. Okay, it only has one base difference from sample three. So samples three and four are more closely related, shared a common ancestor more recently than samples one and four. Now, this gets us back to, to mitochondrial DNA. As I say, mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. Uh, it is, you, while you get your nuclear DNA from both of your parents, you inherit your mitochondrial DNA in an, basically an exact replica, exact sequence from your mother, the same DNA, that mitochondrial DNA sequence that she has. And in a very kind of simplified explanation, it has to do with the fact that when we Okay, say getting back to biology 101, the sperm and the egg, you've got each of them have a nucleus, and they each have one copy of the nuclear DNA of each chromosome, or basically a copy from, from that you're going to have the mother's DNA combining with the father's DNA. The egg has lots of mitochondria, the sperm has few mitochondria, and when the sperm fertilizes the egg, it introduces its nuclear DNA, but not its mitochondrial DNA. Okay, the mitochondrial DNA are not actually integrated into the fertilized egg. So you inherit only your mother's mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA does not recombine, does not mix with your father's uh, mitochondria or father's DNA. So by comparing DNA and, and creating those kind of family trees that Alan Wilson and Becky Kahn and Mark Stone King did, uh, people have been able to actually identify uh, particular lineages and di their distributions around the world. Okay, and we call these lineages, lineages these different 
mitochondrial DNA lines, haplogroups. Okay? And they all get a different letter. Okay? And so we can see, generally, as a broad picture in Oceania, we, we have four mitochondrial lineages that dominate the mitochondrial DNA. Okay? Lineages P, Q, and B. Okay? And then there's some other M and N's in here as well. But primarily P, Q, and B we'll be talking about today. And there are different mitochondrial lineages in the Americas, and they're one of these is B is shared because of a common ancestor here in East Asia. So you had people carrying the B lineages across and into the Americas and people eventually carrying the B lineages down here into Oceania. So when we look a bit more closely at the variation that we see okay, in P's and Q's in, in the Pacific, we can see that We've got these lineages here in New Guinea and the New Guinea Highlands are primarily P's and Q's. And the B lineages are found mostly out here in the islands. By the time you get out here to Polynesia, you have almost a total frequency, a total uh, saturation of haplogroup B in Polynesia. So high frequency of B haplotypes in Polynesian populations. So when we start reconstructing this big worldwide family tree, we can see these are the African lineages that are get designated the L lineages. The L3 branch is the group that actually left Africa about 70,000 years ago, splits into the M and the N branch, and then we see those splitting into numerous other haplogroups down here, haplotypes down here. Now the P, or sorry, the Q and the M lineages and the P lineages that we see in the Pacific are very, very ancient. They, the common ancestor of those lineages, okay, with any others, are, is quite, quite deep. Okay? And it has been estimated to be about 50,000 years okay, ago. So these lineages are only found in the Pacific region. Okay? So it looks like this fits very nicely with the archaeological evidence of first arrival, people carrying these P, Q, and ancient M lineages into the region. The other major lineage that we see in the Pacific is the B lineage. This is a much more, a much younger lineage. Okay? And it, again, debates about exactly when, and when it appeared and was possible to be carried into the Pacific region. Uh, it's certainly probably within the last 10,000 years, okay? possibly a little bit earlier. So much, much uh, later than the, the dear oceanic lineages. So it has been suggested that if the B4 lineages originated 10, 15,000 years ago, that it could fit in terms of populations moving in at a later date, okay, into the Pacific and out into Polynesia. And so these B4 lineages have been associated with the Lapita expansion. So now we've got archaeology, language, and biology, kind of this nice story about the movement of people, languages, biology, culture, all moving together. And this tied in very nicely with the linguistic out of Taiwan model. Okay, we find these B lineages in East derived, they, they originated in East Asia and they were carried uh, relatively recently into the Pacific region. So this fast train migration, the fact that the Polynesian lineages, the Polynesian peoples had almost exclusively B lineages, suggested that there was not a large amount of interaction as these people moved out of, out of Taiwan. They moved through the Bismarck Archipelago, not pick, picking up some uh, P and Q lineages, but not many. And by the time, in, in moving out into Polynesia, we have very few. Uh, P and Q lineages and, and almost exclusively B lineages. So, as I say, this fits very, very nicely with the linguistic model of out of Taiwan. Okay? And this is a, a recent uh, analysis of the linguistic data, which is identifying a number of different pauses in this migration. So it's not necessarily a fast train, but it is an express train of sorts that pauses or has a few stops along the way. And this is the final uh, pulse out into Polynesia. So populations moving from Taiwan, the language is changing slowly uh, and ultimately reaching Polynesia. 
So that was all a nice little story and that was, everything was ticking along and the biologists and the archaeologists were talking nicely to one another and then people started looking at another genetic marker where we had mitochondrial DNA giving us kind of the maternal lineages and the movement of maternal lineages across the globe. People started looking at the Y chromosome, this little tiny this X chromosome here, nice and big and little tiny Y chromosome there. That is what makes an individual a man, a male, having a Y chromosome. So people started looking at the Y chromosome, which does not recombine with any of the maternal DNA. So in a sense, by looking at Y chromosome variation, while it is in the nuclear genome, it's not mixing with the maternal DNA. So it's giving the equivalent of a mitochondrial DNA marker, but telling us about the history of, of men and the movement of men, the movement of these male uh, Y chromosome markers. So this is just showing you mitochondrial DNA gets passed down from women to all of their children. If they have males, all of you men out there, you are mitochondrial dead ends. You do have mitochondrial DNA, but you will not pass it on uh, to any offspring that you might have. But you do have a 50-50 chance of passing on that Y chromosome in each event. Um, so the Y chromosome gets passed down uh, through the male line. And we can do the same kind of thing, identify particular Y chromosome lineages and reconstruct the evolutionary history of them and look at their distribution around the world. And we have slightly more uh, Y chromosome variation. Here we can see in Oceania five major types. But when we start breaking it down into the Pacific, the Y chromosome data give us a very, very different picture than the mitochondrial DNA evidence, where most of the mitochondrial DNA of Polynesian populations uh, was Asian-derived, these Asian-derived B lineages, and very little near-oceanic uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, in, in the Pacific. Here are the Asian-derived mitochondrial lineages here. You see all the colors, lots of them uh, in, in Polynesia. Very few Melanesian or near-oceanic uh, lineages out here in Polynesia. The Y chromosome gave quite a different picture. While we did have some Asian-derived Y chromosome lineages in Polynesia, there were many more uh, near-oceanic or Melanesian-derived Y chromosomes. So people started going, ah, okay. Maybe the movement of men and women is going to be slightly different. And yes, that is true, depending on who, when a couple gets married, for example, where do they move to? Do they move to, with the wife's family or do they move with the husband's family? Who typically moves? That can actually create quite different patterns of Y chromosome versus mitochondrial DNA variation. Um, and that is a possible explanation. But it does make, mean that things are slightly more complicated than a fast train out of, out of Taiwan. There was clearly some mixing going on between, uh, between populations. And as we say, the, the language of love is universal, uh, and we have evidence of this here. But when we start looking at other genetic markers, not just mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome, again, we start to see something that doesn't quite fit with this out of Taiwan, Lapita people are, are this one group, the same group that's moving through and ultimately kind of look like Polynesians. That was kind of the assumption. Um, when we start looking at microsatellite DNA, this is, this is nuclear DNA, these are our markers uh, that, are, that uh, again provide us interesting uh, evidence of, of population affinities. We see Polynesians over here with Micronesian populations and all of these perhaps what we might expect as Lapita peoples okay, out here in New Ireland and so forth uh, are quite different, quite uh, distinct from, from Polynesian and Micronesian populations. So the more recent genetic, human genetic data starts indicating that things may not be quite as, as simple and neat as this initial uh, idea about Asian origins for Lapita. And archaeological evidence, of course, is indicating uh, also that there is uh, integration and interaction taking place. When we